And while Ai Weiwei may not think AI is the future for the artistic world, it is certainly proving beneficial in science. NASA is using the technology to sift through years of data, finding connections that would be impossible for a human to detect. And our next guest is in charge of exploring those secrets. Dr. Nicola Fox is NASA's newly named Associate Administrator for the Space Agency's Science Mission Directorate. It's a very long title, but she's joining Walter Isaacson to discuss future space missions, including the recent Artemis II crew announcement. Thank you, Chris John and Dr. Nicola Fox. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. The uh, Biden administration just proposed, I think, $8 billion or so for scientific research for NASA, which you get to oversee. Tell us what's in that that's particularly exciting. Oh, there's lots of exciting things. So this is, you know, the biggest budget that we've we've had uh, for, for NASA science. So we're really excited. Um, we are sort of moving ahead, uh, really um, establishing our Earth system observatory. So um, thinking about coordinated measurements that look at all different types of of climate impact um, so we can really protect our planet. So looking at, at you know, the ocean, um, the water level, uh, where the um, looking at, at uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and, and, you know, studying pollution and all of these different things, but doing it in a very coordinated way. So that, um, and then actually producing, sort of moving on to produce actionable information. So it's not just, oh, look at this data, isn't it really interesting? But it's look at this data and, and you know, the, this, is, this is what it really means. Well, give me an example of that. What, what could we do practically from this data that you're hoping to see? One of our studies is actually looking at wildfires and where they're located and where they where they're breaking out and and you know what the conditions are um, in the region so that you could maybe you know start to predict that you could have wildfires or certainly um, bring in much quicker uh, the, you know the ability to contain them and so that's you know one one element. Um, we'll also also in our budget um, we are uh, have support for a mars sample return mission and that's a very exciting mission so you may have seen um all those beautiful images from the perseverance rover um as uh, as it's traversing around it's while it's been driving around it's actually been taking samples um into little little sample tubes and sort of can you know putting them into into a cache inside the rover um, and just a few weeks ago, the rover laid down 10 samples on the Martian surface um, and then has sort of driven away and is going to go take more samples. Um, we are now designing the mission that will actually go to Mars, um, have a lander, pick up those samples and bring them back to Earth so we can actually, um, for the first time, really study uh, the surface of Mars. So really excited about that. That's a joint mission with um, the European Space Agency, too. What about sending humans both to Mars and then from Mars to the moon? Yes. So, uh, of course, we are really building on the success of our Artemis One launch that happened in November of last year. You know, uh, there'll be crew that will go in the Artemis II, so they'll actually go around the moon. And then Artemis III, we will uh, land people back on the moon at the, the southern pole of the moon. And then we're sort of really looking at that from a couple of things. You know, one is to have a sustained presence at the moon to actually, you know, be able to, to work and do science and really, you know, do great things at the moon, but also as the sort of the first point to, to then sending people to Mars. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's all sort of one big coordinated program, um, sending people back to the moon, sending a mission that can actually retrieve samples. It will be the first time, by the way, with Mars sample return that we've ever launched something off another planet. So, um, you know, just a, a one big um, sort of push to really further exploration. What is the role of private companies like SpaceX in the missions that you're going to be doing? So we're really um, enjoying the partnerships with uh, with the commercial um, commercial providers. They are really helping to open up space for everybody. Um, you know, we just look at the number of launches that we have, the number of things that we are able to put into space. You know, sending crew uh, to the to the ISS, which is always a really exciting thing to do, um, and so and really helping us make these technological breakthroughs. Um, so pushing the boundaries of technology and just opening up. Um, the the ability for us to get to space. So they're extremely important. 
We actually have a program, uh, the Commercial Lunar Payload Service Program, and that is we're putting sort of NASA science um, onto landers and onto rovers that are provided by commercial partners. And it is, you know, we we put out a call, the commercial partners were able to uh, bid to be able to host um, the, uh, the, the NASA science, um, also some uh, commercial science going on there too, but enabling us to get NASA science quickly up to the moon uh, to start doing those experiments that we've been waiting to do. One of the great technology advances that's mesmerized us for the past few months is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning on huge data sets. As NASA's chief scientist, you've got one of the biggest data sets around. How is that transforming what you're doing as a scientist at NASA? Actually, we have a lot of, of examples of using um, AIML in, in our data. And often it's it's being able to find those little signatures that um that you know we miss when we're we're very focused maybe at looking at at event data. And so you know, you see a big event happen and you look at all the data and you you write your papers. Um, but often because we're focused on those kind of things, we don't stand back and look at years and years and years worth of data kind of in one go. But can you give me an example of that? Yes, certainly. So if we if we think about sort of some of the really big um, solar storms that we see that cause really big space weather events here at Earth, and we've been trying to find if there are sort of any precursors, anything in there that, um, that might tell us that this event is going to be bigger. One of the, the the challenges we we had is we haven't had a really 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 big space weather event for a number of years, and so uh, we actually went back and used um, data that isn't even from scientific spacecraft. Um, is some of our Air Force partners, and we took some of the engineering data and uh, working with Amazon Web Services, we sort of um, actually got that data set ready to be ingested and to be ready for AIML, and then we were able to find signatures that were associated with some of the larger events back over the last 50 years and actually find some signatures that going forward, we know we should look for these signatures in future large space weather events. And since we've just had such an active sun with lots of great aurora um, being visible, we've, we've certainly got some great candidates for um, new science uh, data sets that we can apply these AIML AI, techniques to. You talk about solar storms and space weather events. That's sort of your expertise. But tell us what those are and how it might affect us on Earth. So uh, obviously our sun is, is a pretty active star. Um, we think of it as, a, as an average star, but it's a very important average star because it's the one that sustained life on our planet. Um, and if you look at the sun just invisible, um, it looks kind of like a plain disk. Um, if you look at it within ultraviolet, you suddenly see um, there's all this activity and you can see all these sort of loops that, of, of plasma, these magnetic field loops that stick up above the, uh, the sun's surface. And every now and again, those sunspot groups can be very, very active. And so they actually um, can almost explode. And these, these magnetic field lines break, they snap, and they let all of this coronal material material sort of just accelerate away from the sun. Um, and often if that sunspot is facing us here at Earth, so as the sun is rotating, if it's actually facing us here at Earth, then all that plasma gets accelerated at millions of miles an hour and can come and impact our planet. Uh, it can cause large scale changes in our magnetic atmosphere, our magnetosphere that sort of protects us from uh, the solar wind and space. Um, it can power very, very beautiful aurora, just as we've seen very recently. But um, auroras in the sky, that's a big current system. So that can actually impact our power grids, our um, you know, long pipelines, undersea cables. It can cause problems for spacecraft in orbit. Um, so you know, the, the more we rely on technology, the more we are susceptible to what's happening on our sun. Your expertise is in uh, heliophysics, which basically means the science of the sun. Uh, and you've done a probe. You were in charge of the probe that went right to the edge of the sun. What did we learn from that? So yes, Parker Solar Probe um, bravely flies through the the sun's corona um, in the sort of the uh, where it's you know millions of degrees um, of of heat and. Uh, we are learning all about the atmosphere of a star. Um, so, you know, for for 
decades and decades, we've studied the sun, uh, we've studied it, we've looked at it in all different wavelengths. We've been in at that time as far as the planet Mercury. And so we've been able to study um, the extended atmosphere of the sun. But we really didn't know, you know, you, you, you know, you know that things are happening in certain regions, you know that there's suddenly an increase in heat, and there's a big increase in energy, and it causes that, that corona to um, accelerate away very fast. But you don't know what the processes are, because you haven't been you haven't flown through them, you haven't actually flown and found out what what is happening in that region. And so with Parker Solar Probe, we've been able to do that. Uh, we've certainly found that things that uh, the the sort of the processes that we thought could be causing heat, um, things like magnetic field lines sort of kinking on themselves and then snapping back straight, um, which actually can release a lot of heat and energy. Uh, that is happening further away from the sun than we originally thought um, on our very first perihelion pass or our closest approach, the very first one where we thought, oh, you know, that'll be nice. We'll see see some see see some interesting stuff and we actually started seeing these little features um these little switchbacks they're like sort of s shaped um features in magnetic field lines where they're kind of kinking back on themselves um we saw those um in the uh, you know the the very first orbit as we get closer we've seen them getting larger and getting more frequent um and so you know finding out these these sort of reasons that the sun is such an interesting star um and what we learn about our sun, we can apply to other stars in other stellar systems where we also see space weather. We see, um, you know, these big flares and big events that we see on our sun, we see them on other stars as well. So as you're looking for habitable planets in other stellar systems, you know, what you learn about our sun is directly applicable. When you got your degree in physics from Imperial College London, uh, you are often the only woman in any of the classes. Tell me about your path and tell me about the way we can open up that path to more women being in physics and astrophysics. Yeah, so I, I did do physics and, and it was a pretty low percentage of, of women. Um, and you know, it was it was tough. Um, it, it was tough because sometimes, you know, you felt like I I, I don't understand something, but I don't want to ask the question because I don't want to be the the one who looks dumb. And so, you know, it, it it takes a little while to get comfortable with being okay asking the questions. Um, and and you know, I, yes, I I did my uh, my degree. I did a, a master's in engineering, and then I came back to Imperial College and did my PhD. And uh, you know, moved moved to the U.S. Um, there was there were there weren't a lot of women. Um, I've seen a great um, increase in the number of women um, coming into into the industry, um, taking up very leading roles. Um, and I think it's you know it's important as as a woman to talk to other, particularly to to girls, and say you know you can do this, um, and there is a role for everybody in this type of business um, and to make sure that, you know, you're being very supportive. I'll do things like I'll ask, I'll ask the dumb question, you know, the, the one that, um, you know, that I'll embarrass myself and I'll ask the question and then everyone feels comfortable asking questions. There's just little things that you can do that make a huge difference to, to how people interact with one another. What's the really big question that you'd love to have answered during your career? Oh, Gosh, so many. But um, I really think, you know, that it's the are we alone in the universe? You know, we are really focusing with the James Webb telescope, finding so many um, exoplanets, finding, you know, even even now managing to take measurements of of the atmospheres around exoplanets. You know, what 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 are the building blocks? What are the things that actually would sustain life? You know, we're excited in September of this year. We have Osiris Rex. Um, returning to Earth, bringing samples from an asteroid, Bennu. Um, and that asteroid has been around a long, long time. It was back, you know, we think it was there sort of at the time um, that, that our planets were forming. So it's got those kind of molecular building blocks inside the asteroid, maybe able to tell us about planet formation, about what caused us to be able to sustain water here and therefore sustain life on our planet. And then it tells us what, you know, what kind of things, what signatures we might want to look for when we're looking in other stellar systems. Um, the next big uh, astrophysics mission that we will start um, will be the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And that really is a mission focusing on not just looking for, for you know, exoplanets or looking for planets that happen to be um, orbiting stars, but what is it that we would look for to find signatures of life? 
also sending um, Europa Clipper to, uh, to to fly sort of through the methane plumes at, at Europa and see if there's any signatures of life there. We have a dragonfly mission that's going to go to Titan that's a sort of, um, a, a, it kind of hops around. It's like a quadcopter. And, and they're going to be looking for signatures of life in, in Titan. So they're the kind of questions that it's just, I mean, not, not necessarily finding another planet like ours, but just finding life elsewhere. I, I think that's the big question that, that I'm really excited about. And why is that so important? For me, it's just curiosity. It's that feeling of, you know, really there must be, you know, what, what else is out there? If you think just back to the 1950s, we didn't even think we could go to another planet or go to the moon, you know, and, and now we've got, we've sent our own spacecraft that have left even our protective bubble, our heliosphere, the two voyages that have, you know, gone past every planet and are now out in interstellar space, you know, looking at next generation missions that might go very fast out of, of our heliosphere and actually explore interstellar space, thinking about what it would take to get to the next nearest star and how do we just, how do we expand what we know? And that's why I think it's important. Uh, we talked about the practical reasons that we're doing all these things at NASA, and you've talked about the pure curiosity, the elevated reasons. I want to read you one of my favorite quotes in science from the mathematician and physicist Poincaré, and he said, scientists do not study nature because it's useful to do so. They study it because they take pleasure in it. Tell me, is that true for you? Oh, it could not be more true. Um, I mean, it's everything is fascinating to me. I mean, but you know, being a scientist is just fascinating. It's the wanting to know more. It's the, you know, I again, talking to talking to kids, being a scientist is not about being super smart. It's about being really curious and it's about really liking to ask questions and always wanting to know more. And it, and it is it's just a joy to study this. And I mean, being at NASA is is even, you know, we're, we're studying things that are just amazing. The technology is at the forefront, the science is at the forefront, and there are always more and more questions. Every mission you fly, you have three questions roughly. You want to, you know, they're your sort of high level science goals, but you know a good mission is going to create 30 more questions from those initial ones. And so that's, that's, that's it's just a joy to do it. Dr. Nicola Fox, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.